started here in just about a minute. Could we have the panelists to look at that? Here they are. <laughs> My name is Rome Chelly. I help organize a group called Rochester Art Collectors. Has anybody here ever heard of Rochester Art Collectors? Excellent. Uh, can I ask another question? How many people here would consider themselves an art collector? Who collects art here? Oh, one, two, three, five, six. How about how many people here own at least one work of original art not uh, made by themselves, made by somebody else? Just about everybody. How great is that? So um, we want to redefine the notion of what a collector is to include people that have maybe only one or two pieces but aspire to have more. So our definition of a collector is someone who owns or aspires to own at least one work of original art made by someone other than themselves. The group was conceived in the fall of 2017. Uh, it was launched April 1st, 2018. So we're coming up on our one year anniversary. We have 380 members in Rochester. Uh, the group is really, although not exclusively about local work, we have a very strong interest in local work, which is why we're here today, helping to celebrate the 10th anniversary of a gallery and the first few months of another gallery. It's a wonderful opportunity to do that. So yeah. Probably a bunch of you have also uh, many, many years ago, so it's exciting to see it revitalized and have a gallery in the middle of downtown, almost like a big city. Folks who are living and can walk across the street from their apartment, how great is that? It's, it's almost a new place to live. Thank you very much to uh, RIT City Art Space, to 1975 Gallery for collaborating on this program. Much appreciated. I encourage you to go to rochesterartcollectors.org. It's very expensive to join, so I'm just going to warn you, it's free. So the, the, we want to encourage as many people as possible to join the group, participate. We have some events coming up on this coming Thursday, the 28th. The Memorial Art Gallery has been holding panel discussions on collecting art, specifically collecting art. We're going to just have a party beforehand, so come down to the Brown Hound inside the Memorial Art Gallery at 6 o'clock. Have a drink with us, hang out, we're going to cause a little trouble. Then we're going to go into the auditorium to hear a panel discussion on collecting art. On Friday, April 12th, we're going to celebrate the life's work of uh, Bill Stewart out at Main Street Art Center in uh, Clifton Springs, New York. Anybody here familiar with Clifton Springs? If you haven't been out to this space, it's absolutely beautiful. Bill Stewart's been working in our community now for 25, 30 years, 35 years. He's heading out of town, still great shape and we'll be close to the family. So there'll be a small retrospective at that location. Uh, so we're going to help to celebrate that. And Shirley Dawson, who used to have a gallery downtown called the Dawson Gallery, will be speaking about his work. He'll be there as well. On Monday, April the 22nd, we're going to be at the Out Alliance doing what we call Dialogue Art 2019. This is an environment where we bring collectors together with artists to talk to each other about topics of interest. So it's not a presentation, uh, it is really a dialogue, it's a conversation. The top will be uh, interacting with people on social media, engaging collectors on social media, and using social media to, to learn about artists. That's on Monday, April 22nd at the Out Alliance. The show that uh, for that month is 19 emerging, so it's emerging artists we be showing you at the gallery space. I'm gonna hand over to John, thank you very much, and enjoy the show. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm John Osp. I'm the gallery director for the RIT College of Art and Design and the new uh, City Art Space, which just opened in December. So we're glad to see you here on Saturday. Uh, we're also really uh, excited to be hosting a few of the artists who are in this uh, really fantastic show called Just Folks. Uh, and uh, it's been a very well-received show. And uh, there's um, a lot of talent up here. And it's just a fraction of what's in the show. So. We're going to hear uh, a little bit from them today, We're calling it Folks Just Talking. So this is a, supposed to be a very casual talk, nothing formal about it. And uh, the first thing I want to do is introduce uh, the curator of the show, and then um, I'm going to hand it over to him to tell you a little bit about the history of 1975 and wall therapy, because it is a 10-year celebration, but the way those two things evolved and, and sort of how they plugged into the community uh, have unique sort of stories. 
And uh, it's also worth noting that uh, the curator uh, of the show is, is an RIT <coughs> alum and also an employee of RIT, so he plugs in very nicely. We also have a, an RIT faculty on, on the stand here with us today, so uh, we're really excited to sort of plug that into our programming. Uh, but if, if there's any time left over, uh, we're going to talk to the artists, but if there's time left over and you guys have questions, we want to leave time for that too. So if you have something in your head and you want to uh, ask or talk and become part of the folks, just talk and just uh, let us know. But first I'd like to introduce the curator of the show, who again, like I said, is an RIT alum and also uh, an employee. And uh, for the last 10 years, he's been engaged very heavily in the art community of Rochester. He's been cultivating local, international, and underrepresented artists, both in his gallery uh, through 1975, which used to be a brick and mortar space, but is now obviously sort of a nomadic entity. And uh, through his involvement with wall therapy, he's really started to engage the urban landscape and community involvement with bringing art accessible to the public and on a massive scale, and it has turned into an internationally known sort of mural project uh, that is very well known. So please help me welcome our panel of artists and the curator, Eric S. Lake. Thank you. Oh, man, I don't have to say anything else. John, John got it. <laughs> um, so before I, 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 I talk too much, I, I do want to introduce everyone on the panel. Um, next to me, Justin Suarez, more commonly known as Mr. Perfect. <laughs> but you can call me Justin. Uh, Brittany Williams, St. Monsey, uh, or Michael, <laughs> uh, David Schnuckel, uh, Carter Burwell, and Mike May. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I, I wanted to talk a little bit just about the history. Um, if you were at the last time we gave a talk at the Dearly Departed show, I rambled on for an hour, so I'm going to try not to go in depth, too in depth past that. Um, but uh, basically, a little over 11 years ago, uh, I was back then still working at RIT, uh, and I was having lunch with my roommate, who was a, a student at the time, and he looks at me and he's like, Hey, why are you still at RIT? you do and so much other cooler stuff. And I was like, well, I actually like my job. You know, it's, I, I get a lot of opportunity. I like working with, with you, et cetera. Um, and, and I have adult problems. I've got a mortgage. I've, I've got a, a car payment. I've got all this other stuff. He's like, well, what would you do if you didn't have to worry about that stuff? And I was like, not without skipping a beat, I was just like, oh, that's easy. I would have an art gallery with a design studio in the back, blah, blah, blah. And he just kind of looks at me and he's like, so why not? And, and it ate at me the rest of the day. That's all I could really think about. And uh, when he showed up that night uh, back home after his classes and work and all that stuff, uh, I kind of grabbed him and I was like, all right, uh, one year from now, I'm going to have my first show. I don't know what it is. I don't know where. I don't know how. But I'm going to have it. And... 11 months later, and all kinds of drama and broken bones in the middle. Uh, I, had, I had the first show, which was called Inauguration, which was October uh, 2008, in the then open surface salon down the South Wedge, where Little Button Craft is right now. So if any of you made it to the Dearly Departed show, uh, one of the things that was so rad and special about that is it was back in the neighborhood where it all started, literally across the street. So if I had walked out the door, didn't get hit by cars crossing the street, I would have ended up in the place basically where this whole craziness started. Um, so it started as kind of a pot, more or less a, a um, semi-permanent space inside surface. And we did that for about three and a half years. And it was really me trying to figure out how to do all this stuff. I'm not trained, I'm a tech nerd by day. That's my main gig. Um, I just am incredibly passionate about art. I am a collector, to put it mildly. <laughs> um, and I, for me, the, the, the starting the whole project was I, I had a bunch of friends who just didn't, there was no champion for, for the art I liked in the city at the time. And 
I wanted to do something about it. I had friends who were incredibly talented who kind of were like falling away from making art because they had bills to pay as well. And it's just, it was, again, with no champion, you're having these gaps um, in, in, in possibilities and opportunities. And uh, yeah, so like the first year, I, I literally was like, I hope I can last a year. Uh, we'll see, who knows, you know, if anyone will show up. And um, like I said, 10 years later, people still show up, which is pretty awesome. Um, very quickly about wall therapy. So as we're doing these projects, a couple of folks up here, um, Justin and, and Monzi, uh, and, and Sarah Rutherford, who is with us in ominous, wonderfully ominous spirit. She's watching all of you. Um, and uh, Leah Rizzo, we formed a little collective called Sweet Me Company. And we're, we've been doing these installations uh, in, in, in spaces, kind of, of showing what you could do with a space and art it the hell up. And we we're doing one in what would be in the public market, what would become the, uh, the yards. And we found out that there were these world-renowned muralists and graffiti artists painting down under the Union Street Bridge. And that was Faith 47, Dolly's, uh, Freddie Sam, and Mac One. And some dude named Ian had brought him in. Like we did, like some people knew who he was. Not others knew what was going on. We went down met them, and then about a couple months later, I finally met Ian. And we're having this like, oh, like we, for that whole time, all these people were saying, oh, uh, you got to meet Ian. You got to meet him. You got to meet Ian. You got to meet him. So we finally met, and like for the next hour, just rambling nonstop, nonstop, back and forth. And like, oh, so this is what it's like to have a conversation with me. It's just like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of jumped in there originally just to do marketing and like, build a brand, build a website. You know, originally it was called Visual Intervention. And I'm like, Ian, that's too long. We gotta shorten that. And uh, so the brainstorming came up with Wall Therapy, and, and together we built the site, built branding, all that stuff. And then after the course of that first truly like life changing week in 2012, where at that time, Justin and Monsi were also painting. Um, like everything changed. And I, I kind of understood at a level that I just had before the role of what, what, what I do, what we do, can have in the city. Um, both as, as, as bringing these pockets in, of inspiration to the city, um, just, just how we interact with each other in the city. Um, how, you know, as we would go on now, we've, we've put up 132 murals over the course of, in this case, it's, it's about eight years, seven or eight years. Um, we've turned the city into this free 24-7 public art gallery that you can go to any time. You don't have to worry about the doors. You know, like, you know, well, obviously, like, they put up some gates on some of them, which is really annoying. But, <laughs> can't, can't do anything about that. But the idea is, is you know, and one of the, the, the biggest moments for me in that it was the second show in, in 2009, is someone came up to me and just said, I, I don't feel comfortable going to an art gallery, but I feel comfortable here. Like, I, I feel like I've, I can, I'm allowed to come into this because it wasn't a traditional white walls. And that very much colored how I was going to try and approach, like making art approachable for everyone, breaking down the walls, and then building, like letting people know, it, like the, the common person know, it's okay to like art. You don't have to understand all of it, you can just like it. It's a start, just like start small, and go from there, and, and just let it be what it is, but let it be a force in your life. Um, so that's that's kind of where it is. I mean, that's, that's kind of just a whole lot of that over the last 10 years. <laughs> Um, you know, repeat. <laughs> so, so I'm interested to hear each of the panelists kind of discuss how you became involved with the project and how you bounce off these ideas of how, uh, both in the wall therapy project, if you've been involved with that, but also in 1975, how it's created an atmosphere of collaboration within Rochester. When I first met Eric and Monsi and Sarah, I was uh, a line cook at Dinosaur Barbecue. Um, 
in 2011, I believe, I was involved with wall therapy for the first time. 2012. 12 was the big. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, that was the the second time that I painted a large scale mural in Rochester. Uh, the previous time was with Epi Way Crew down on Clinton Ave. Um, and yeah, that was my first permanent mural in Rochester. Uh, the winter after that first wall therapy, um, my mom passed away from lung cancer. And at that point, um, I had a lot of introspection on, um, on the fact that life was short and that I wanted to be doing what I wanted and that the only way that I was ever gonna get there was to, like, to make that transition, to make that jump. Um, and I ate dirt for a few years, trying to get off my feet. Um, Sarah and I did a lot of knocking on doors around Rochester, uh, looking for people who were interested in murals or were just willing to let art happen. Um, to like give us their wall with the idea that it's just paint. And if you don't like the way that it turns out, it can be painted over. Um, and yeah, this was outside of the scheme of wall therapy. So like we were hungry to be out here making murals out in public spaces. And at the time, like being paid for was not our first priority. Just getting our work out there was. Um, and when I wasn't in Rochester, I was doing that in New York City, and I was doing that in other cities that I visited. Um, and yeah, particularly in Rochester, like through wall therapy, the public, as well as us as artists, became hungry for mural art. Um, and that was one of the biggest things that really started creating this environment where an artist could make their livelihood in Rochester. Uh, and I don't make my life but just in Rochester, but like Rochester is home. Um, I'm originally from Albany, New York. I've lived here for I think 14 years now. Me and my wife just bought a home here. Um, and there's so many things about Rochester that make it like where I want to be as home. And I am incredibly thankful to Eric and to Ian and to the city as a whole for like embracing all of us as artists. Hello, Ian. <laughs> okay, um, I met Eric in 2014, and this was just based off, I was like a fan of wall therapy. Um, my mom sent me a link uh, via Facebook, um, back when it wasn't like problematic back then, um, <laughs> of like, Oh, there's a, like a mural fest that's happening in Rochester, and I was like, oh, like this is cool. And I'm in college at the time, and so 2014, I told my mom like, let's go tour and see the murals. I want to go see the murals, and we for the at at the first stop we go to um, forget who did that uh, Jimmy Juice Ernest. Um, so we meet at that uh, wall and. I'm just like, oh my God, this is amazing. I started having a conversation with Ernest. And then uh, Eric rolls up in his car. And I guess like people say, oh, Eric's here. And so like, my mom's like, oh, that's the guy. Like he pretty much does wall therapy. And she was like, you should go talk to him. And at the time I was like, no, I'm not gonna bother that man. He's clearly busy doing a paint run or something. And yeah. And she was like, no, you should go talk to him. Like, you never know what will happen. <laughs> and so I go up to him, and I'm just like, hey, like, I'm Brittany. I'm a fan of what you do, you guys do here. Like, this is amazing. You're doing a great job here in Rochester. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, having the same energy that he has now. And, you know, I told him, like, you know, I'm an artist here, and, but I, I just, I just want to volunteer. Like, I was looking to just help out. Um, and he's like, yeah, you know, there's an application online, you should check it out. And, you know, like, thank you for all, like, thank you for the support and everything like that. So, I do that, my mom's like, see, that's what happens when you talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yeah, yeah, all right. And, and so I go, and you know, I'm torn around and I meet, um, I go to Sam Rodriguez's wall, because he's one of my favorites. And that's where I met Ian, 
And my mom's like, that's Ian, you should say something. <laughs> and so I, I, I tell him, I was like, you know, same thing, like, I love what you guys are doing, blah, blah, blah. And, and he's like, you have a show at the Bug Jar, right? And I said, yeah. And he's like, oh, your, your work is amazing. And then it kind of went from there, I said, thank you. Then 2015 hits, that's the first year I started painting. And uh, Ian hits me up on my phone and says, like, hey, do you want to be like one of the local artists for raw therapy? And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> and that's my first year painting. I've never painted before. Um, and yeah, it's been going on from there. I thought they were going to give me like a little small wall like that size. <laughs> they give me a whole building and I was overwhelmed. Yeah. But, um, you know, I was nervous because I, I didn't know what to expect. But I got a lot of good feedback with that. And from there on, it's just gotten me opportunities from there. And now I love painting and I'm always looking forward to doing murals. And just, what, two years ago, I do a three-story building. Like, I'm afraid of heights. And I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> but, I, you know, I take on the opportunity whichever way I get, but I thank Eric and Ian for those opportunities as well. Um, <clears throat> I met Eric in 2009, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I moved to Rochester in 2006, straight out of school. Uh, I had just finished my master's degree at Oswego, and I got a job teaching at MCC here. Uh, I didn't really know a lot of people here. Um, I had been coming from Oswego to paint at the, the legal wall. Uh, well, it used to be the legal wall at Village Gate. Um, so I, I kind of had a, a couple friends here. I knew at least like the graph community. Uh, I didn't know Perv at the time. I knew of Perv. Um, but you know, I, my background in, in creating was really in, in traditional graffiti. Um, so coming down to paint the legal wall and things like that was really where my, my interest was. Um, and I didn't know a ton of people who, who had similar interests, especially um, in the arts or creatively, um, until one day I, just, I had a, a studio in the Hungerford and I just happened to see a postcard for a show um, that was a, a show around tattoo art. Uh, and it was being put on in a salon, um, this place called 1975 Gallery. Uh, so I went to the show and I was stoked that people were showing tattoo um, just showing art that I was interested in, in seeing and wanted to see and that I didn't feel was being represented really anywhere. Um, so I made it a point to, to reach out to Eric and say, hey, I'm, I'm an artist. I have a studio here in the Hungerford. Um, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, I, I'd love to meet you, chat, come by for a studio visit. Uh, and he did, and we completely nerded out about art for, for a while. For two hours. For about two hours, yeah. <laughs> Um, just like, oh my god, do you know who this artist is? you know that artist? Yeah, he's like, yeah, I have a piece of theirs. <laughs> um, and, uh, it, you know, it, it was just, it was great to start to, to meet people. Uh, eventually, I did meet Perv, uh, and we linked up with, with Sarah Rutherford and Leah, and we started with um, Sweet Co. But it was, it was about finding this, like, community of, of like-minded individuals who um, didn't see a lot of their own work or the type of work that they like being represented or at least being seen very often. Um, so, you know, very early on when we started Sweet Needs and then eventually in the Wall Therapy, it just became this ever-growing community of, of like-minded individuals who, who came from similar backgrounds, um, either creatively or academically, um, who were just super eager to, to create um, and to kind of you know, make our own ways when there weren't a lot of opportunities um, or spaces for us to show our work. We take a space that had no electricity, no heat, uh, and we lock ourselves in there for a month or two and put on these elaborate installations. Um, and it was, it was sort of energizing um, this, this whole uh, spirit of collaboration that, that developed over these few years. Um, and then to see it just continue to grow, you know, eventually it was like early on, like it was kind of us and Sweet Meat, and then it was wall therapy, and it, it just became this large, like international thing. And suddenly, I was I was a, I was a part of it. I painted in wall therapy for two years, um, and it was it was very um, what's the word sort of 
touching to, to know that I was a part of this um, thing, especially very early on. And um, you know, again, it's it's I think just been like a fire that was created in, in a lot of us to really pursue our work hard um, and to, to do all we could to, to sort of get it out, uh, especially in this community where you know. 2006, 7, 8, there really wasn't a lot going on. Um, and, you know, to sort of find that energy amongst ourselves um, has, has been great. And I think it's, it's still sort of feeding a lot of us. Um, so I'm, I'm just super grateful to, to sort of have been a part of that. Hi, my name is David Schnuckel. Um, I am um, I am a I'm a faculty member at the uh, glass department at RIT. Uh, I'm also a glass artist, and my uh, relationship with Eric was uh, in a an exhibition called Hermit Temperament back in 2014 at 1975 with uh, another individual named Scott Lefebvre, yep. who's Colorado based. Yeah, he's in Denver. Denver, yeah. So um, it, it's been a while, and it was a time, my, my relationship with Eric um, at, that, at that exhibition opportunity was at a time when uh, I was uh, not only a glass artist, but a, someone who was approaching glass uh, by way of imagery and text. So um, there was a very illustrative nature to the work that was uh, happening at that point, or at least coming to an end at that point, that um, is not uh, noticeable in the work that's in the gallery today. But at that time, we had this really uh, interesting pairing uh, that Eric had joined, Scott and I. The, the work seemed very similar uh, uh, formally and visually. The color palettes were very minimal. There was like a black, red, white sort of limitation to that. Um, I don't remember his mediums in particular. It's, it's using like a gel. Technology. <laughs> Um, yeah, he was using a lot of uh, like gel transfer, pinnacle of paint, spray paint on, on wood. Yeah, I mean, and it was a very bold, sort of dynamic, very graphic. simplified, illustrative, sort of like vintage pop sensibility, which I was also sharing at that time, too, in my own way. At that point, um, uh, I mean, I was approaching uh, very traditional modes of uh, glass imagery, and glass imaging processes through what's called enamel, which is a vitreous, glassy paint that is fired on, kind of like uh, ceramics is on clay or glazes on ceramics. Um, and so at that point, um, that was a very interesting sort of parallel that gave context to my work um, that I had seen before, kind of this context of street art and outsider art and um, uh, uh, yeah, just that pop sensibility. Things like, um, even things like that, that guttural sort of uh, uh, dissident spirit of like stall art and tagging was very much a part of that show too. So. Um, it was kind of a fun way for me to see my work in the context of work like it that had nothing to do with glass or related to glass at all, um, which was really important. And it was also flat. I was using, um, I'm primarily a glass blower, which is, you know, making things in the round, so to speak. And at that point, it was all wall mounted work, like a lot of the work here, uh, framed and uh, using predominantly sheet glass. All found materials as a way to sort of resurrect things and bring new life to, like, any sort of, any sort of item that was discarded and previously considered trash or useless. So um, at that point, that's that's kind of what was my MO was um, giving uh, these these uh, disregarded things um, a new sense of purpose and uh, ultimately creating sort of like a collage of illustrative glass components. Um, I don't know where one. Could, I guess one could find it. Dig deep into my website at davidschnuckle.com. I can see <laughs> things like that uh, back in the archives. I think it's a body of work that I call. Uh, I can't remember what I called it. I'll have to dig it up and maybe shout it out later. Yeah, I know. So on, on like the Night 75 Facebook page, there's a whole album, there's a whole show. Is that okay? But I, just, yeah. I don't remember the, like the sub, your subtext for that show. I so. can't remember either. It's been so long. I don't think you ever told me that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, that wasn't the only time I do. I know it was a little outside of the 1975. Um, agenda, but I know that at the time I was teaching with my colleague Michael Rogers in the glass program and we uh, had approached Eric about using 1975 for a collaborative exhibition of, of our program, student and faculty and staff work at that point too, so I feel like that was a nice extension of what 1975 was, was uh, 
aiming to, to do as an exhibition space. As, as a side note, with that show, it's, it's unfortunate, it was like the only opening that I wasn't there, because I was out, I had to go to LA for like the Google Street Art Project. And I mean, in this room filled with thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of delicate glass, filled with people all walking through it, <laughs> like the proverbial china shop. And I just remember like texting my, my assistant's time, like, is everything cool? Is everything cool? Did anyone not getting over? Is everything cool? I can't afford to pay for this stuff. <laughs> is everything cool? <laughs> I didn't know anyone at all here um, for about two years, really. Um, I actually got a job at RIT in the School for American Crafts, and that's actually where I met David, 2007. He was pursuing his master's there at Glass, and I was working in that department. And then in December of 2007, I actually met Eric, because he also works there, you have heard already, um, at a Christmas party. And through my relationship with him, knowing him and him beginning his gallery in 2008, October, that's whenever I met her, and then Monsi, obviously I met David, then I met Ming, um, and then I just met Brittany recently too. So, um, I actually got into glass and using that as a medium, a primary medium through David. He showed me how to do sandblasting and that's where I began experimenting uh, after I graduated from RIT in 2015. But that's pretty much my story. I'm more behind the scenes with 1975 over the years, um, and then into wall therapy, and kind of, just kind of in the background. So I'm just now kind of coming out and showing my art and getting part of the community. Yeah, and and, and I'm, I'm going to just call it out. So if you ever went to the openings and you ate the delicious food, that was the, the beginnings of what was called Baker Cleave It, which was, was her. So she was <clears throat> really well known for the creativity in, in, in how the, the food would pair with the show. Um, all the while pursuing art quietly under the radar. And then um, there's a little bit of dragging, kicking, and screaming out into the public sphere, into shows um, over, over the years. But no. it was you did it. You did it. <laughs> Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Mike Ming. This is my artist handle. Um, I actually, me and Eric go way back. Uh, we're, we're undergraduate students in RIT and I studied illustration. And um, that was after I left RIT in 1995. I went back. I'm from New York. And lived in Brooklyn. Did art, art there for a while. And when Eric started his gallery. I kind of been doing a lot of weird things anyway. Like I just kind of like got into it and um, showed some artwork. And when he started wall therapy, like I also in New York, I paint murals with another group of artists. And that's anyway. So like um, yeah. So then I've been able to come back up to Rochester a bunch of times and been doing multiple shows. And all the while, it's just basically because we were good friends. So I'm kind of got shooting through the back door. I think everyone does. <laughs> These guys, like I'm sitting with, like, you know, definitely but way more. <laughs> doing it more. But, uh, yeah, so I'm honored, always appreciated. And uh, this show for me was also very interesting. And, and uh, yeah. How easy if I ask a question? No. <laughs> so, but, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on this. So, so my interactions with Mike really are, are some of my earliest memories in Rochester. So when I came up from 18, little redneck skater kid uh, from Central Pennsylvania, and I didn't even think I was gonna find skateboarders because back home, not a ton of my skate friends went to college, um, and so I'm like getting ready to just give it up, and I end up finding at, at the benches at, at RIT this, this enormous enclave of, of skaters who are in all different majors but heavily in, in the arts. <clears throat> and, and so one of my earliest like arty memories 
of Rochester is is from with Mike, and he found out I, I had a bass. I didn't say I could play it, but I had one. <laughs> I didn't play it very well at all. And and he he's like, oh, I just bought a saxophone. Let's go to Webb Auditorium on Saturday night and just like jam. And I'm terrified because I don't know what I'm doing. And and just I remember like trucking down the quarter mile carrying a bass and this little mini practice amp and I was like, I have no idea what is going on right now, but I'm going with it. And so like him and, and like our whole crew of friends were just were so hugely influential on, on showing me what creative creativity is, really. Because um, prior to that, I'd like, I made t-shirts you know, back home, and, and I never considered myself an artist. Like, I, you know, at best, graphic design. Um, but it's like all my other friends were the artists. I, I'm, just, I'm just this dude on the side. And those guys are like, nah, nah, nah. You know, like, it, it, it's, it's all so much more, so. Yeah. Actually, I'm still like, no, today. I was part of a audio video, so I was the guy who was rolling the TV sets into your classroom or like falling asleep at the slideshows of the auditorium of like art arts. So we were it, we had keys that gave us full access to all the theaters so it was easy for us to just go in and live live on and with the fun times. We had maybe nights. Yeah. Uh, so, I won't drill into any more questions just yet in case any of you have questions. So I'd love to turn it over to the audience if you guys have any questions about to any of the artists up here, to Eric, if anything's coming to mind, anything? If not, I'll drill them up. Right here. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you. I have a recent uh, arrival to Rochester, New York. And about two and a half years ago, uh, it was the summertime, I was visiting my niece who lives over on Park Avenue, and she said, I have to take you on a tour, and she took me on a tour of all the wall therapy walls. I was living in New York at the time. And that was like planted a seed in me. I was like, this is really fucking groovy. And I could totally live here. And now I live here. Um, so I guess that makes me groovy by definition. <laughs> but I just wanted to thank you for making the city look so welcoming. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. Round of applause for that. So, one thing I, I forgot to, to discuss, I, I talked a little bit about it in the beginning, but um, you know, so over the last decade, I've worked with about 350 artists through, through group shows, solo shows, um, you know, wall therapy, etc. And trying to call that down into a small selection for the show was brutal, because um, I know someone's going to be mad at me. <laughs> but, Ultimately, like, like everyone that's in these room, in this room, and on this panel, represents like very specific moments or stages in the history uh, of me just learning how to be a curator. Because um, that's not I, definitely not what I went to school for. I'm just kind of you know making it up as I go. You know, I come from like punk and skateboarding, DIY ethic, do it yourself, and. A lot of the, all this stuff, you know, kind of what, what these guys have said, um, it boils down to, well, no one's doing it, so I'm going to do it. I don't know how to do it. I'm going to figure it out and then adapt and just keep, keep moving forward. And that was you know, something that we really strive to do in, in any project, whether it's United States by Wall Therapy. Or, with the sweet meat, the yards, or, or any of the, you know, one dance company when they were there, you know, doing their thing. Um, it was all about, like, like, you can do it. Whatever it is, you can do it. Just, you have to do it. You have to stop thinking about it. You have, at some point, have to put, like, pencil to the paper, rubber to the road, and just start doing it. And, and you're gonna fall, you're gonna fail, you're gonna hopefully be successful. And it's, it's, as long as you just keep pushing forward on that, then, then you are a leg up on, on so many other folks that will just, they just won't do it. You know, they, they, they'll, they'll think about it, and for whatever reason, a lot of times it just, it may just be like their, their own like self-confidence and their ability to get it done. Um, and so, like with the, the, the terminology, just folks, 
you know, one of the things that, that Ian and I have really strived on, and like you, you coined it in the street, sweating someday, you know, like during wall therapy, and we were talking, we were kind of like having this reflective moment about like what we've accomplished. Because I don't often, like I don't often do that, a couple of people here can test, like I usually, like the fact that we're kind of doing these 10 year shows is a different, because it's also turning the spotlight back on me where I'm trying to like show everyone else. Um, but we had this moment of kind of like self-reflection and we're like, dude, we're all just folks. Like there's truly, I mean, I'm sure people could argue, but I'm like, there's really nothing special about us other than the fact that we're willing to put in the work to make it happen. And again, trying to lead by example, it's like, you can do it. 1975 and all this stuff started as a dare. Like that's really like, why not? Why not, dude? Like, like that sentence really kicks it off. Yeah. It's more than just putting your father doing it. You're placing your art in space, and all the criticism, and use your father, open yourself up to that. And I just want to know, like, what do you guys? How do you combat your your ego with that? Like, what do you do? Like, so I mean, I can sit. I'm gonna do. It's that, I'm gonna do one real quick. Hold on. <laughs> so I, I will tell you that even the days running up to this opening, I was still worried that no one was gonna show up. Ten years in, I, I, you don't get over it. Yeah, I even like painting walls now. Um, I would say at one point in every mural that I do, I have those self-doubty self moments where I'm like, oh, this is going to be the one that I really screw up. <laughs> and I like, I literally like try and practice self-affirmation. Like, you got this. Like, you can do this. This is your first rodeo. And like, get through it. Um, and like, Brittany and I, uh, we run a, a city-sponsored program called Rock Paint Division. Um, Uh, and working with youth who have little to no painting experience, they are constantly going through these experiences like you were talking about. Um, they're in a room with other people making art. Um, they're all at different skill levels, so it can be very intimidating at a certain point. Um, we also talk with our group a lot about the idea of the ugly stage of painting. Um, so your sketch, once you get it dialed in, is kind of of art on its own and then as you start to fill in everything with colors it starts to look really bad and that's when we have our self-doubting moments but you have to like we, we talk about trusting in the process and just this idea of like pushing through to the end of something and you're not always going to hit a home run um, some murals that I do I may not even like to share with people, um, but it's important that I get to that point where I am able to walk away and say this is done. Um, to answer that question, I was I was pretty um, open to criticism early in life because I was an athlete first before I was an artist. So um, high school it started like. Whether you win or lose, everybody has something to say, whether it's good or negative. Um, and then when college comes, you know, you're in a, um, I played Division One basketball, so you're pretty much in a bigger uh, platform than that, where you're open to fans who are paying money to see you play, and then they'll still say negative stuff. Like, you remember like message boards back in the day? <laughs> like people who would come to games, regardless if we win or lose, it was something was like, oh, they're this and they're, like we just won the game. <laughs> and also like criticism, do you take negative or positive? It has to be constructive, like that's something that we teach our kids too. If someone says, well, I don't like this because I, I just don't like it, then you kind of just like, all right, whatever. <laughs> but if it's like, you know, I'm not a fan of this, but I think if you did this, it would make me, you know, see it more or be a fan of it more. And you can take that, you can say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna take that criticism. Or you could just say, 
I see your point, but I'm still keep it the way it is. Um, yeah, like when I when I first started, I was I was nervous. Like I've never painted on a wall, and but it was key for me to just ask people who have experience, like, how do you go about this? Like, do I use this? Do I use that? Like, how does this look? How does this look? And, you know, people just say, just go for it. Like, you, you just gotta go for it. You know, take it, take the experience in, and as you get better and better and better, you're gonna look back at that thing like, wow. Like, I came a long way, but in those instances, you just gotta like, take what you can get. Some things, if you, over your career, it's just gonna be like, negative and positive, but you just gotta look at the positive side, get the people who support you on your side, and just do it for them, and do it for yourself. Um, you know, I, I think I think as artists, we all have um, a little bit of an ego. You know, I think it takes some ego to just make work, even if nobody ever sees it. Um, so I think you sort of have to just have some confidence. But I think what helps build confidence, at least especially for me early on, was having a group of people, uh, of peers. I collaborated a lot early on, um, and having people that you work with who you respect, um, I, I think goes a, goes a long way in having a, a community of, of, of other artists um, to, you know, pretty said to sort of ask for, for help or um, for opinions. Um, I think that goes a long way in helping to build your confidence. Um, and not only that, but, you know, in collaboration, there's also this sort of, even if it's never sort of admitted, there's this little bit of like competition that drives you to, to sort of meet the level of your of your peer, um, and I think as you continue to work with with others, um, it, it it again it, it sort of builds your confidence, um, and you know like Per said that those those doubts or sort of negative emotions they never go away, um, but I think it becomes a, a little easier to to deal with them or to accept them and know that all right I'm going through. This, this tough time, and to sort of work your way through it. Um, and, and I think, again, it's just recognizing that those moments are gonna come, letting them come, and sort of experiencing them, sort of like leaning into it a bit, and then sort of making it through the other side. Yeah, uh, as far as painting murals and what's, what you think is acceptable in public, I think it has, really a lot more to do with like um, just everything they said and um, <laughs> headphones <laughs> not listening to what someone has to say while they're going by and also whether they say good or bad things like you know it's it's you make mistakes all the time and some people you know you might catch it yourself because you're the person creating the work but other people won't see that you know what I mean so you have to just get past that and know that like okay I'm doing this and then if you finish your one piece and then you know you go on to the next piece and stuff and then you you know you build up more and more and more and you're happy with what you're doing or sometimes like you know as I've found myself doing is a lot of like uh, introspection and then kind of like no I don't like that anymore or I don't want to do this style anymore or I'm not interested in what I've been painting before and then kind of just redoing it again, ultimately it's a lot of probably having to just trust what you're doing per se, like what, what I'm trying to do. So that's not, not in an ego sense, but like more like what do I want to bring out and share with everyone else? And like how is that going to be expressed? So I think that's, for me, it's always been like how it seems to work out. And of course I see like these guys, they're all amazing. Like you see the work that's on the wall, you know, and then to hear them say like, oh, I don't know, maybe it doesn't feel right, or like I might not like that, you're like, oh, okay. You know, so <laughs> if, if that's how I feel about it, then, you know, it must be kind of the same, you know, so like, you, know, you just trust that that's, that's exactly what it is, just trust. And share. Make sure you love it because you want to share. I think definitely the hardest part about making art is making art that doesn't turn out the way that you want. Um, and like 
getting past making a lot of bad art, because you have to make a lot of bad art to get to the point where you make something that you really like. And when I look back at murals that I painted even five years ago, like, I don't like them anymore. Um, I, I don't like to look at them, but I'm comfortable with the fact that I created them and that they were one of those necessary steps to get to where I am now. Question. Uh, I have my question for David Schnackel in, in the response to that question. So your your piece back here seems to taunt the audience, <laughs> the viewer directly into um, touch my art, smash my art, here's the, here's the back of the piece of art, yes, I see you don't like my art, um, or this is the ugly face. What, how much of your piece back here is a direct taunt or response to the audience on that same question? How do you deal with criticism? Uh, Tom. How do I how do I deal with criticism? I think that it's not unlike um, Let's try this one. Um, one of the things that um, I'm thinking about as we're having a conversation about criticality and its role in history of practice is that um, I'm not only an artist, but I'm an educator, as I mentioned before, too. So uh, we just got through a week of critique, as a matter of fact, uh, with students. So um, this notion of talking about the work is really important uh, for one's development. And it's not only um, important for the artist whose work is being talked about, but it's also important for the community of, of critics who are actually talking about the work, too, because that helps uh, develop a muscle that's hard, actually, to, to talk about what one sees and to then talk about where those associations might take their viewing and how that may or may not um, jive or be compatible with the intentions of the artist. So, and, and the piece that I had done in the back there, it, 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 I see it as a, a very playful extension of where my practice currently resides. Um, I had just finished putting up a, a solo show down in Tennessee that had taken a lot of my time and energy for the past several months. And of course, I wanted to honor Eric by participating in this exhibition as well. So essentially what had happened was once I got back from that solo show uh, opening, I essentially had maybe six days to put something together that felt right, that felt like it had some sort of um, uh, relationship or, or, or uh, compatibility with my thinking with where the, the body of work currently is, and it, it does, you know. I, I essentially am thinking about this body of work as um, uh, asking a, myself a, as a question, mostly dealing with um, uh, issues or conversations dealing with contemporary craft practice. So if um, I use this sort of specific glass object that I make in the hot shop, this, this stemmed cup, if this thing, you know, demands a lot of uh, skillfulness and thoughtfulness to build it up, how can I react to that? How can I break it down in an equally thoughtful or skillful way? And so uh, this piece gave me a chance to counter that in a much more playful than intellectual way than the previous work. So I saw it as an opportunity to um, be very public and have a very vulnerable uh, opportunity to take that risk and, and to kind of uh, have that conversation with myself in an exhibition context. So um, that's how I, I see it connecting with the previous question. I interpreted it as participatory art that I should um, interact with, and I was told it wasn't that much. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, if you haven't read his statement, on that piece, please do before you leave, because it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah. So some of you are represented in places other than Rochester. You're on a national, and I think in some cases, international scene. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, I guess, uh, like, one of the first things I was talking about was this idea of just wanting to be painting walls. Um, and willing to paint walls and doing a lot of free work. Um, a lot of times when I was doing those free walls, and I, I still do many free walls each year, 
Uh, and people say, like, how can you do this without getting paid? And one of the, my first responses to them is always that, like, murals are, in a sense, a billboard that promotes our brand. Um, and they're a permanent billboard that may only cost me a few hundred dollars to put up versus a business that has to pay thousands and thousands of dollars a month. And then you talk about New York City, and that is tens of thousands of dollars per month. Um, so it was, in a sense, like a little bit of a calculated move that if I get out there with my work, then people will see it, and then my name will spread. Um, but, you know, I think Eric had said before that he didn't know what he was doing when he started, when he started this. Um, I don't necessarily know what I'm doing now, but I am doing it full time. Um, when we started Rock Paint Division, we had no clue what we were doing, uh, but we figured it out along the way, and a lot of that was just a willingness to try and to go out there and do it because you're the only one that was going to make it happen for yourself. Um, yeah, like sitting at home and waiting to be discovered is not a very good way to set yourself up for success. Um, and like, yeah, there's a lot of compromises that come along the way in figuring out how you are going to become sustainable. Um, so not every job that I do is a job that I want to be doing. I do a lot of commission murals, uh, private work. Um, I, I carve pumpkins professionally for a couple weeks a year, so that has sent me to Dollywood. <laughs> and I never ever thought that I would be working with children, working in Dollywood, carving pumpkins. Um, but it's all like stuff that I get to do like on my own terms. And it, I really appreciate that aspect of it. So you're a person of my West Coast gallery? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I have, yes, I have two uh, galleries in San Francisco, uh, one in New York. Um, and, you know, I, I decided early on it was really important for me to get my work out as much as I could, um, you know, as much as as, as I love Rochester and as supportive as Rochester has been, um, I think it's important for all artists to try and get their work out to as many people as they can. Um, and people always ask me, like, how did you get these galleries? Um, it's a lot of cold emails and a lot of silence, you know? Um, you send emails, you, you do a lot of research. I spent a lot of time researching galleries um, who represent artists who are maybe similar work to what I do. Um, and I just email them out, uh, maybe send some images, and very randomly, not very often, I'll get a response, uh, and we'll, a relationship will start to, to form. Um, but I, I definitely think it's, it's important to um, find uh, and sort of foster relationships outside of the city that you're in. Um, and it's, you know, it's hard. Uh, but luckily we live, you know, we don't have to mail out slides anymore if people remember slides. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's sort of um, being prepared to, like, never get feedback, you know? I know a lot of artists back in the day was like, be, be prepared for um, uh, disappointment, right? Um, now, it's, now it's just a lot of silence. <laughs> um, but again, you just sort of hope that eventually, um, you know, your work lands in, in the hands of somebody who, who is willing to work with you. And, and to that end, uh, you know, Monsi was a cold email. And it literally was, I get this email, I see these, the artwork, and my first thought is, please don't be a jerk. <laughs> oh God, please don't be a jerk because I want to work with you. Like, this stuff is really cool. Um, and like I said, we had like a big, big, big right. conversation, but that notion, you know, and, and you didn't, like social media as a tool for artists wasn't nearly as prevalent at that point yet. Um, I mean now, you know, as, as I'm watching how everyone is, is using social media to help get out to create these new opportunities, um, you know, it's, it's, it's part of it, it is there's no, 
there's no excuse not to at least try. Because you know, you're giving away your information, your data, which is a whole other discussion. But you know, the tools there to start spreading the news about yourself are all there. Just use them. I mean, that's how we build this stuff up. Yeah, I mean, as far as social media, I think it's it's important for all the art, all artists to be as active as possible, and not just like constantly creating content because that's like a whole new conversation and pressure of you know, oh, shit, I gotta make some stuff for Instagram. Um, but like, just being active with other artists that you um, who you respect or admire, um, and constantly just engage in conversation and um, introduce yourself to other artists and see who they're showing with, and um, I, I think. That's, that's been very key, especially in the past couple of years in, in fostering new relationships. It's just, just being active and engaged um, in, in social media um, and not just a matter of like creating work, creating like, um, like commercials for your own work, but just being engaged with the art community and other artists. Um, and you know, just send them a message, say, hey, I really like your work. And, and um, again, just continue to foster those relationships. I think go a long way nowadays. And actually, on that, um, just another like tip, you know, it, 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 everything wants to be saying 100%, but like injecting bits of your personality into what you do, like show what you love, show what you care about, what moves you, like that builds like, like a familiarity, and, and ultimately, like it's, it, if we're looking at trying to build followings and stuff like that, that's the part that people connect to. It's like. If all you're doing is showing, just showing work, showing work, showing work, like that's, I mean, you might as well just be a, a, a painting on the wall. But if I start showing, like, this is what excites me, these are the people that I, I like, this is, this is um, what moves me, that creates this full, fuller picture of each person as an artist that, that gives people something to connect with. Right, one more question. So, uh, I was a person who, uh, I was born in 1975, so I come from an era where we're not accustomed to holding a phone up and saying our own pictures. Now, to me, that's really weird to oh, yeah. take my picture of my own face. <laughs> so, how do you insert your personality into online relationships with, without? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, 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 I, people might argue, I, I, if you look at the span of how much I'm putting out, like I don't do a ton of selfies. Monty has like no selfies on there. You have to like force him on there, you know, per his own. That's my wife. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Per his own. You know, it's, it's like, I'll like speak, speaking for myself, like my, the gallery account is, is filled with like show promotion and who, who I love, etc. cetera. Um, it's filled with the nerdy stuff I love. Toys, music, skateboarding, you know, Halloween, etc. It's just like, you know, and, and you know, the occasional selfie, the you know, occasional group shot. It's like, hey, this is who I am. Um, even starting to do more stuff like, like, uh, like with Instagram Stories. Now that you know, integrate that feature from Snapchat, and you're kind of like one stop shop, right? Um, one of the things that I've told a lot of people is, you know, like, do live streaming of you making stuff. Right? Put it on a little tripod, set it near you. It doesn't even have to have your face. It just be like a little tripod over your hands while you draw. And you know, take a break, look what some people are saying. Like I do it randomly, like when I'm making like the old Rochesters or like working in my basement or something. Just this usually it's a Friday night because um, <laughs> and just to see who's watching. Because you never know, like random people are gonna show up and you know, like I said, those those just experiment. Like what? Don't like Michael said. Like don't do stuff that you don't feel comfortable doing. Like it's got to be organic and authentic. Um, but experiment with it. Just try it. Just put a camera up. And if it sucks, delete it. You know, like it's, that is. You know, you, you can do kind of this like little meter bits and pieces. All right, anyone else? Uh, I gained a following by taking pictures of my feet different places. <laughs> so like wherever I would be, I would like just hold my feet up and shoot that. Recently, I'm actually... <laughs> some interesting followers. <laughs> um, but actually, I recently cleared out my person, my professional account. 
um, of all my personal stuff, and I do a lot of progress pieces because I think it's really important not just as people who collect are interested in looking at art, seeing where it starts, how it progresses, and then the end, but also for artists. Because I think for me growing up, I kept seeing all these finished pieces by all these amazing people and never really knowing how to get there. So I use Instagram to follow other artists, watch their progress. Like you said, the stories are really helpful. If you're working on a specific technique or new medium and you're like experimenting and testing stuff out, you should like show that. So that's more what I try to do now, as opposed to feed shots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of a lot of people really want to see these process shots. Um, a lot of times when I post a, when I post a, a picture of me painting that was taken by someone else. That seems to get a, uh, a better response than the finished product. Even. Um, and I think that's because it like humanizes the art form in the process. When people see a three-story tall mural, they just think to themselves, like, I could never do that. And how does somebody do that? Um, but to see a painting in the ugly stage or a sketch of a piece, it, it helps people like, oh, oh, maybe I could do this. And like. If you practice enough, you, you sure could. Yeah, I mean, it's like any other pursuit. You know, you're trying to figure out how to fix something on your car, what do you do? You go to YouTube, right? If you were going to try and do it yourself, you try and watch the steps to figure out how to do it. It's the same for us as artists. It's important. Yeah, I, I just actually pointed out how, like, your, your sketch or the, you know, the rough stages of your piece will get more likes than the original. And that kind of throws me off because it's like, this is a rough sketch and it'll get like hundreds of likes and then your final one is just like, I don't know, like, yeah, crickets basically. It's like, I worked so hard on this and I wanted to get more than the rough draft, but yeah, like, it's good to just show that, all right, I drew this from square one, now it's a painting. And then, like, even when I was on my stories for this show, I um, showed a little bit of um, my process by using, like, my portable projector, um, like, taking my sketch, putting it, like, on a USB and connecting it to my portable projector and lining it up on the, uh, on the wood panel. And I got that technique from this one right here. And, um, and I would get messages like, what are you using? And oh, what, what kind of projector are you using? And that's just sharing knowledge like, hey, I got it from such and such Amazon, like you can get it from here. And, and then like, of course, the, you know, what materials are you using? And what brushes is that? And you share that as well. But I also say like, you know, the materials don't make the art. It's like your content that you're putting out. So you could get like thousands of dollars of golden paint. That doesn't mean that your painting is gonna come out like, you know, a, a well-known piece. It's all about the content, but um, but yeah, sharing knowledge. Like a lot of kids message uh, message me, like younger kids about you know, hey, I do anime in class and my teacher doesn't like it. Like, what should I do? And I just tell them like, keep going with it. Like you, you, and they love hearing that because they don't think that they think that what their teacher is saying is the right thing. But you tell them like, hey, just keep doing what you're doing. Use the materials that you got, like start from the basics and move on up because that's how I do it. I started with little basic primary colors and then as I got better, you go into the good stuff, you know, the expensive stuff. <laughs> but um, yeah, just share what you have. Don't be selfish with it. Um, if they are selfish with it, you can always find it on YouTube, just know that. Um, and find the videos that are like nine minutes, you know, long. You don't want too much because it's just a hot mess. <laughs> Me and Justin go through it all the time. We're looking for techniques and then it's like 20 minutes of just like, so, brush. No, you know, how was your day? Then it's like, come on, I just want to get to know the technique. Like, get straight to it. But yeah, it's good to share. Anyone else? So uh, they're going to hang around a little bit more. Please feel free. We'll get the chairs out of the way. Take a look at the show. It's the last day of the show. Let's give a big round of applause. For them.